it's my pleasure to start this panel with a, a, a pre-panel talk by an expert in international humanitarian law, Dr. Wen Zhu. Dr. Wen Zhu is legal advisor of the Arms Control and Conduct of Hostilities Unit at the Legal Division at the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, in Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Zhu's functions include coordinating, developing, and representing the ICRC's legal and policy positions on a range of disarmament and new technology issues, including outer space, autonomy, and artificial intelligence, and the legal review of new weapons and weapon systems. Dr. Zhu has previously worked as associate legal counsel with the World Bank and assistant professor of inter international law at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. So let's please welcome Dr. Zhu. Thank you. So good afternoon. It's always not easy to be a speaker after lunch, especially when the subject is law. So I'll try to do my best not to bore you too much. Um, so as Chris has kindly introduced, my name is Wen Zhou. I'm a legal advisor at the ICRC. As many of you know, the ICRC is a neutral, impartial, and independent humanitarian organization with our headquarters in Geneva and our humanitarian operations around the world in over 100 countries. Our mandate is given by states in the Geneva Conventions to act to, to assist and protect people affected by armed conflict. We have a unique role when it comes to international humanitarian law, or IHL. IHL is also known as the law of armed conflict, or used in BELO, is a set of rules aiming to limit the effects of armed conflict for humanitarian reasons. And we, the ICRC, are often referred to as guardian of international humanitarian law in terms of promoting, clarifying, and developing this body of law. So today, I'm going to ask and hopefully answer three questions. The first one is, why IHL and outer space? And second, what are the existing restrictions under international law on military space operations? And third, what needs to be done to minimize the risk of civilian harm arising from threats to space systems? So, the first question, why IHL and outer space? Well, we human beings have so far avoided a Star Wars-like scenario. It is a fact that space and space systems are playing an indispensable role in military operations in today's warfare and outer space is becoming a new theater for major uh, power competition. So as a consequence, the likelihood of space system being targeted during armed conflict also increases, whether it be the space or the ground component or the, or the communication link between them. At the same time, as has already been underpinned by several speakers before me, technology in enabled by space systems permits almost all aspects of our life today. Space systems, in particular navigation, communication, and Earth observation satellites, enable the provision of essential civilian services on Earth, and also contributes to every phase of humanitarian operations, including those conducted by the ICRC. For, for, for these reasons, we, the ICRC, are primarily concerned about the potential human cost for civilians on Earth of the use of weapons and other military operations during armed conflict in relation to outer space. So now let me answer the second question. What are the existing limits under international law on military space operations during armed conflict? Let me stress that military operations in armed conflict, be it through kinetic or non-connected means, are not, do not occur in a legal vacuum, but are constrained by existing international law. So here we talk about first the UN Charter and the relevant rules of customary international law prohibiting the threats or use of force in international relations, including in, in relation to other space. And we also refer to the space law, especially the Outer Space Treaty, the Law of Neutrality, and IHL. 
International law restricts certain military activities in outer space, including the choice of weapons, means, and methods of warfare involving outer space. In particular, as we know, it is prohib prohibited to place in orbit space objects carrying nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. It is also prohibited to use weapons that are by nature indiscriminate or of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering or causing long-term widespread and severe harm to the natural environment. There are also a number of specific types of weapons that are pro prohibited by law. IHL also contains uh, constraints military operations including those that are carried out in outer space or if their effects extend to outer space. So IHL includes in particular the, the principle of distinction, the prohibition on the indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, and the obligations to take all feasible precautions to avoid or at least minimize the incidental civilian harm. International law, in particular IHL, also offers a specific protection to certain objects and persons in armed conflict. In this connection, it has been proposed that states should refrain from any acts that would impair the provision of essential civil services uh, that are, uh, uh, that are space-based. And in our view, such services could include those critical to the provision and maintenance of objects indispensable to the sur survival of the civilian, op uh, civilian population and to persons and objects specifically protected under international law. I can give you one such example. That is the space system critical to the safety of installations containing dangerous forces, such as nuclear power plants. So as you can imagine, there are challenges as to the interpretation and application of existing international law to outer space. This is due to the specific characteristic of the space environment and also due to the accelerated development of the space sector. I think what is very relevant to today's gathering is the growing trend of military use of commercial space capabilities and the involvement of commercial space entities during armed conflict. There are certainly legal implications on the dual-use space systems themselves, on the companies and their employees, and on states. Among others, this makes it, as a matter of fact, more difficult to distinguish between civilian objects and civilians on the one hand, and military objectives and persons directly participating in hostilities on the other hand. So as a consequence, it puts civilians and civilian objects at risk including of being misidentified as lawful targets. This is why the ICRC has called on states and companies to physically or technically separate or segregate space systems that are used for military purposes from civilian ones, whenever feasible. So now it comes to my last question, what needs to be done to further minimize the risk of civilian harm arising from threats to space systems? In our view, given the increasingly important role of space systems in the provision of essential civil services, humanitarian considerations should be one of the cornerstones of any future discussion or normative development relating space security. And for our part, we have been participating in the UN Open-Ended Working Group on Responsible Space Behavior in the past couple of years, and we have made recommendations on measures to minimize the risk of civilian harm. We also conduct bilateral and confidential dialogue with governments and the militaries, and we have started to have conversations with the space industry. We are very pleased to see that some of our recommendations have gained traction so, as you may know, in the new open-ended working group on responsible behavior, space behavior that will start next year at the UN, one of the five pillars of this group's mandate will be on protecting critical space-based services to civilians, as well as services that support humanitarian operations. So, let me conclude my talk with two key takeaways. One, 
military space operations do not occur in a liquid vacuum, but are constrained by existing international law, including IHL. And second, humanitarian considerations should be placed at the center of any future multilateral di discussion and an any future normative development relating to space security. So you will find our detailed legal analysis and recommendations in our publications on the screen, including this report that was just launched two weeks ago. So this is the first link on the screen. I look forward very much to continuing this discussion with all of you even after this event. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, excellent. I think that that was an excellent intro and actual overview, kind of a comprehensive overview of this difficult question, in fact, a range of questions of how, you know, how, how can international law, the rule of law, have any say in constraining uh, conflict in space? These are new, interesting questions, but I, I think that there'll be many people who hopefully will be revisiting what we've just uh, heard, um, hopefully taking notes on it, and, and hoping that it, that it impacts and has a say in, in the conversations that we have ongoing on this topic, which is critical, in, in, in fact, fundamental preserving space, uh, peace and space, fundamental to space sustainability. So with, after that uh, intro talk, we're now going to have a, a panel with a range of experts. To my immediate left is uh, Professor Dr. Aoki. Uh, professor Aoki is a professor of law at Keio University Law School, she specializes in public international law, including space law and arms control. She's the president of the, the Japan Association of Disarmament Studies and a director of the Japanese Society of International Law. She's also a chair of the Experts Committee on the Economic Security Promotion Act and its implementation plans at the Cabinet Secretariat of Japan. Professor Aoki, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And I know we're going to benefit from your insights and your remarks. To uh, Professor Aoki's left is Professor Dr. M Melissa Deswart, who is a professor of space law and governance at the University of Adelaide. She's also a board member of the Australian Academy of Law, a board member, uh, and a board member of the Space Industry Association of Australia. Professor Deswart, thank you also for thank appearing you. with us today. To uh, Melissa's left is Professor Dr. Andrea, Andrea Harrington. Dr. Harrington is co-director of the Institute of Air and Space Law and associate professor at McGill University's Faculty of Law. She's also an adjunct professor in space resources program at the Colorado School of Mines. Professor Harrington was previously dean of space education and full professor at Air University of the United States Space Force, where she was responsible for overseeing the West Space Seminar and the Schriever Space Scholars. Professor Harrington, thank you also for joining us. You'll notice that there's a um, uh, growing list of professors of law, and I think that that's really going to inform our panel, and, and I think it's going to be very lively. To Professor Harrington's left is Mark Mozina. Mark Mozina is Vice President of Government Affairs for Planet in Washington, D.C., where he leads the Planet's government relations and policy efforts with Congress and with the U.S. government agencies. Before joining Planet, Mark with ULA, United Launch Alliance, where he handled the civil space portfolio and led government relations with NASA, NOAA, and the FAA. Mark, thank you also for joining us. And a familiar face you may recognize at the far end of, our, uh, of, of my panel, it's Brian Whedon. Dr. Brian Whedon is Systems Director for the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at the Aerospace Corporation, where he serves as a senior analyst and team leader on topics cutting across policy, technology, and economics. Dr. Whedon is also a former member and chair of the World, uh, World Economic Forum's Council of the Future of Space Technologies, a former member of the Advisory Committee for, of Commercial Remote Sensing, uh, and a former Executive Director of the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations, CONFERS. Prior to joining Aerospace, Brian was Chief Program Officer for the Secure World Foundation. Brian, it is great to see you again, uh, and uh, thank you for also joining us here in, in Tokyo, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So to start that discussion off, I'm going to first actually start with Brian. Uh, to get uh, more of a technical perspective so that we know what we're talking about when we talk about conflict in space. So, Brian, um, w can you maybe educate us and do some capacity building what conflict in space might look like and especially how it may be different from conflict in other domains? The floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to Secure World for inviting me back. Uh, another great episode of the Secure World Summit Space Sustainability <laughs> 
So the question is, how is war in space different? I think I'm going to interpret what you asked. And I'll start by making the obligatory reference to Clausewitz to say that uh, war by its nature does not change, right? It is always violent, interactive, and inherently political. Uh, or for you fans of the Fallout series, war never changes, right? Is sort of the, the motto that you hear very often. But the character of war, that is, how it manifests at a particular time and place, certain technologies, certain characters, certain actors, does change. And I think there is some differences to the character of armed conflict, war, and outer space that's really important to know for this discussion of how it might happen and particularly the, the, the legal aspects of it. Um, I'm gonna put in a plug for my aerospace colleagues. Uh, a few years ago, published a report uh, called The Physics of War in Space, both in a written form and also a short YouTube clip that goes into the details. I just want to talk about a couple of the highlights from that. Um, so first, as I hope many people realize, uh, satellites move very, very fast, right? In a freedom units, thousands of, of miles per hour. Uh, for the rest of the world, four to seven kilometers per second. But at the same time, it's very difficult for them to change their orbits on a dime. Right? They, they, they have the momentum, the inertia, they're going to keep moving. It's very difficult to change those things. Earth orbital space is massive. It is that volume just out to geo is several thousand times bigger than the entirety of the oceans and the atmosphere combined. And if you were to say, oh, we're going to monitor and surveil the entirety of the oceans all at once, that's kind of crazy. But we also want to do that much harder problem of monitoring or, or, or keeping tabs on uh, on space, and if you go out to cislunar, it, it just becomes an even much bigger challenge. Timing is everything, and you need to plan ahead because of both the speed and the predictability and the challenges in, in moving satellites. The orbital mechanics of relative motion between space objects is weird. I've got a bit of a background in engineering. I've studied calculus. I know some orbital dynamics. It is weird. It doesn't work like you think it does. In some cases, you move faster to go behind something. Or you thrust in the direction of something, you end up moving away from it, depending on, on the relationship to things. So just the relative motion is very, very, very weird. And there's many situations where things happen in slow motion. A um, little bit of an age check here, but those who've seen the first Austin Powers movie, there's a scene where this guy's got his foot stuck in the floor and there's a steamroller coming towards him. And he's screaming for like a minute straight as the steam slower slowly moves in his direction. For a lot of rendezvous and proximity operations, that's what's happening, right? The satellite is approaching over a period of hours, if not days, and you know it's coming. You really can't do anything about it, and it's just coming, and that's coming. But you have plenty of time to think about it, even if you may not be able to do anything about it. Destructive attacks against satellites are very possible. They're very going to happen. But non-destructive attacks can, in some t cases, be much cheaper, just as or more effective, and are actually what we're seeing happen in real-world scenarios, right? Right now, space is part of multiple conflicts, wars, and we're seeing these non-destructive attacks happening all the time. And finally, I'll say, if you do a destructive attack in space, it can have very devastating consequences that are indiscriminate in nature and globally impactful in ways that are well beyond what you might see in terrestrial warfare. If you destroy a building in terrestrial warfare, that can have long-lasting and indiscriminate effects in that area, but it doesn't affect something 10,000 miles away. That can happen in space. Excellent. So you, the highlight you say is it's weird, but to go over it again, it sounds like time is different, there can be time delays, and there's what are the other like bullet points you want to put uh, out? It's really big. Things move very fast, but it's also hard to change their direction. You know, we think of warfare, you know, fighter jets and, and maneuvering mm -hmm. and tanks maneuvering to dodge things. That doesn't happen with satellites. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Dr. Aoki, I want to ask you the next question. And I know it's a difficult question, but I think the answer from you may be a beautiful answer. How can law assist us in preserving the peaceful uses of outer space? Oh, thank you very much for your question, Christopher. And uh, well, thank you very much for the, for the organizers to uh, organizing this very wonderful symposium. Yes, I'd like to emphasize that there are 
established, firmly established legally binding rules in international law, and I'd state what is prohibited and what is not. And first, threat or use of force, well, from to within outer space is prohibited. Now, that is a fundamental principle in international law to all human activities, to any domains. And, well, second, the Outer Space Treaty provides that the moon and other celestial bodies shall be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Concretely prohibited is the establishment of military bases, installations, fortification, the testing of any types of weapons, and the conduct of military maneuvers. So, substantially, disarmament is accomplished on celestial bodies. And third, in outer space other than celestial bodies, placing in orbit around the Earth or otherwise stationing in outer space an object carrying weapons of mass destruction is prohibited. And for states parties, which are the parties to the Partial Test Ban Treaty, the nuclear weapon test explosion is prohibited. But other than that, the Outer Space Treaty is silent. And so fourth, the military and the hostile use of the environment modification techniques, which have widespread, long-lasting, mm. and severe effects, are, is prohibited for states parties to the, pro, to the for, sorry, sorry, for, for the state parties for the prohibition of the environmental modification convention. So this convention seems a bit futuristic, but this proactive nature would go a long way. So what is not prohibited is, well, placing around the earth or otherwise stationing conventional weapons testing of conventional weapons, or non-orbital vehicles, which are ballistic missiles, or, well, even fractional bombardment orbital system that doesn't make a full rotation of the Earth. And good news, well, recent good news is that General United Nations General Assembly resolution adopted in 2022 that calls on all states to commit not to conduct destructive direct ascent ASAT test. This is, not a this is a recommendation, not a legally binding rule, but it's a very welcomed first step. So well, I think uh, three minutes have passed, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Uh, I want to turn to uh, Professor Harrington right in the middle. You see her. Uh, and because this panel is about the use of manuals and what manuals can do. I w I'd like to in, uh, ask you about the Milamos manual. Where does it fit into this picture? And let's say, can you give it current status on the Mil Milamos manual? Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. So Chris asked me to bring some, so I have a little bit of show and tell here, right? <laughs> I brought uh, volume one, which is the rules for the Milamos manual. Uh, so these are published. They're available in a free PDF online if you search for them. Uh, the commentaries for the Milamos manual, which will go into unpacking the legal background behind the rules that are articulated in this document here, uh, is still in the final editing stages to go to the publishers. And so that is not available yet, but the rules themselves are freely available. And we do have a few copies of these uh, for anybody who really would like one afterwards. I think there's uh, nine or ten of them, so maybe we should raffle them off, but we have a few here. Uh, so this is the McGill Manual on International Law applicable to military uses of outer space. So the McGill Manual is really dedicated to explaining the lex lata, the, 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 the rules, the law as it is, for military activities in space. What that means is that there are limitations, right, on military activities in space. Uh, Professor Aoki just very articulately described some of those that are embedded in the system. Of course, most importantly, the UN Charter, which limits military activities in specific ways, including limitations on use of force everywhere. And so what the Milamos Manual does is it strives to explain what limitations exist on military activities in space, how military activities fit into other space activities where they are fit in right alongside uh, any other uses of space, civil, commercial, etc. 
So what the Milamos Manual does not do is address laws during armed conflict, so IHL, uh, and, and Professor Deswart is going to talk more about the Woomera Manual in a minute, but what the Milamos Manual does is addresses those activities that occur during peacetime or during times below the level of armed conflict. I'm going to apologize for a moment to the translators for the Latin uh, that I'm about to bring forward, because as a law professor that happens sometimes. So Milamos really addresses uh, the the peacetime laws and the use ad bellum, so the use of force, the initial use of force, not use of force during an armed conflict. The use in bello is the use of force during an armed conflict, which are you know, the laws governing armed conflict addressed more so in the Woomera Manual. So we have kind of these two different periods of time in the continuum of conflict that the manuals separately address. And so Milamos was drafted uh, starting with events in 2016, with events all the way through 2022. The initial drafting events were in person events, but of course COVID happened and disrupted the whole process as it did for so many other things. The Milamos project has been led by my colleague Ram Jaku, uh, so this is really his major project. Of course, uh, Professor Aoki is very heavily involved currently as one of the editors of the commentaries and is working with Ram to get that final version of the commentaries out, but this has been a very long process that has involved collaboration from folks around the world, experts and practitioners from around the world, giving inputs into what the existing rules are and how how they apply to outer space. And I will say, just for disclosure on my part, uh, so since I just recently joined McGill, I had previously been a peer reviewer for both Milamos and Woomera, uh, but as I've joined McGill, I've joined the advisory board for the Milamos project as well. Uh, and so my background there is perhaps a little bit different than some of the other folks on the stage as the relationship to the manuals themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Now we're going to move on to Professor Deswart. Uh, Melissa, what is the Woomer Manual and where does it fit into this picture? And please tell us what's the current status of the Woomer Manual and how is it different from the Milamos Manual? Mm -hmm. Wow. Easy. <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, um, the Japanese uh, Cabinet Office and Secure World Foundation. And I think the discussions that we've had over the last you know, day and a half have, have really have been leading up to, I think, some of the questions I hope we can talk about on this panel. So we seem to be living in the age of the manual. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's a very good question to ask, do we need two space manuals? Um, having, like, again, worked on both of them, uh, and they both serve different purposes, I think it's it's interesting to think about what is it, why is it that there is a need or a push to develop manuals. So the the Woomera manual, um, as Professor Harrington has really said, it is it differs from Milamos in the extent to the fact that it deals with IHL. So it it deals very much with the situation of what would the nature of space conflict look like and what are the uh, laws that would apply to that. And of course, that requires you to um, make that conclusion, which uh, Professor Aoki uh, said, is that the rules of armed conflict, as they are part of international law, come in under Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty. The Outer Space Treaty itself, of course, I think is best understood in the context of the day when it was um, concluded that it was fundamentally um, because the space powers of the day realised that um, conflict in space or the detonation of a nuclear weapon in space was going to be catastrophic for all. So I think it's very important that, the, that it's also seen that even though uh, the Woomera Manual deals with IHL, it is by no means, you know, uh, advocating or suggesting that uh, conflict in space is in any way desirable. So I think both manuals share that objective of uh, discussing this, this very difficult topic, but with a view to enabling us to avoid the consequences that, that may ensue. 
So the Woomera Manual has, has just been published. Uh, I didn't bring it with me, I'm sorry, Chris, because I think it weighs about 10 kilograms. So um, I, I didn't want to put myself over in my baggage allowance and still, I still wanted to do some shopping while I was here <laughs> in Japan. So the Woomera Manual was sacrificed along the way. But it, it very much looks like a, you know, an OUP textbook. Uh, it's available for order now. It follows the traditional structure of manuals where you have a rule that is articulated followed um, by the commentary. Um, I think it's also worth saying that when we have these manuals, like I said, why are we making them? Because I think there was a sense that these issues in a period of what we politely call a period of rising tension, that perhaps there is a need for some kind of clarity about what uh, international space law and international law at large has to say about this period of rising tension. And the, the usefulness of a manual is that it brings together uh, into a large, diverse international group of experts, all of whom are acting in their personal capacity, even though they might come from various armed forces or governments or diplomatic role, etc., to get as big a diversity as is possible in managing an international project of that size, and both manuals genuinely desired to do that. Um, but to recognise that these are just the views of, of you know, uh, what we might politely call an international law, sort of eminent publicists. So, you know, they do not purport to uh, be international law. International law can only be made by states. So, in a sense, it's, it's the desire to kind of fill in some of, some of those gaps at a point at which it appears that these problems might be about to arise. And so, for example, you know, the, the, the recent, you know, announcement <coughs> or belief, belief, then announcement, then claim that Russia has a nuclear uh, weapon placed in space um, really brings that, that to the fore. As, as Professor Aoki has already told us, there's, there's a short answer to what that is, but the manual served the purpose of, of providing advice and insight into what the answer to that problem might be. All right, excellent, thank you. Before I move on, I want to just pause for a second because I do have so many people up here who had involvement in both of these manuals with deep expertise in international law. I want to think and ask you if there's any reactions about this. There are, let's think about the sources that are used in these manuals, right? You've mentioned the UN Charter. You've mentioned space law, the special regime of space law. You've mentioned international humanitarian law. Professor Aoki, you mentioned the NMOD Convention. Um, yes, MOD Convention, and also, well, ITU, well, lots of mm -hmm. ITU instruments, ITU conventions and mm -hmm. radio regulations and other international telecommunication laws. So we're pulling on a number of different sets and lists of rules and laws, different regimes. Um, and also, we've drawn this division between Milamos uh, addressing peacetime and rising tension and Woomera addressing conflict in space. Is this a... Was this an issue in um, tr trying to say and find what the Lex Lata is? For anyone who worked on those manuals, what was that challenge like of find, finding Lex Lata from all these, you know? Well, I'll just have one more source, and that is state practice, mm. right? W what are states doing and saying that, that, that explains how they believe the law is or, or how they act with it, right? That's a whole other factor here. Um, and I'll just say, so I served as the technical expert to, to both manuals at, at one time, uh, and that was a huge challenge, right? I'd be asked, hey, what practice exists for this? And in many cases, the answer is none to very little mm. in terms of like actual behavior or specific statements. So that was one of the challenges we had in, in, in working on both manuals. Mm. And, and if I may jump in, uh, really what you've articulated, Chris, is one of the great problems of public international law in general. This isn't specific just to space or just to IHL. In international law, understanding and finding what the Lex Lata is, is 
almost always a challenge, is very often a challenge. Uh, this is a challenge that the ICJ often addresses with the cases that come before it, sometimes you know, multiple different rules of law within the same case that they're addressing. So this is not a unique space problem because the primary sources of international law rely on state practice. So when you're talking about treaties, state practice is one of the tools of treaty interpretation that exists in international law. You look at how states who are party to the treaty are behaving, and if none of them are calling out that behavior as violations of the treaty, and it's being conducted in a widespread way, then we assume that the practice supports that behavior as being within the context of the treaty. You also use state practice to find rules of customary international law that exist separately from and alongside treaties. Of course, you also need to find that states have a belief that they're bound to act the way they're acting in that practice for customary international law. With treaties, you already know states believe they're bound because they have ratified the treaty that, that, that exists there. But for customary international law, you have to find that additional evidence. And so much of the literature in public international law is a debate about whether a rule of law exists and how it is interpreted, depending on what part of the international law regime that you're looking at, what type of law you're looking at. And so really, a lot of the fundamental questions that get asked in the space community, not necessarily the public international law community, but when the space community addresses space law, are these questions about you know, who, who says what the rule is? How do we figure out what rule exists? How do we enforce the rules? And these are problems that we have to understand are systemic across all areas and across the history of public international law. Yeah, true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Finding international law and running international law is to, well, identify which state practices have the belief that it's a law. And uh, for instance, the Outer Space Treaties parties are just around 14 states. Well, it's not so many as other environmental-related treaties, like, uh, well, United Nations Convention on Climate Change is more than 193 countries are parties, and the uh, MOD Convention just 78. But China, United States, and Russia are parties to well, this convention, so it's important, but no state practice. But well, no state practice doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean that it's not irrelevant. So, well, like Andrea said, well, Professor Harrington says, and other people says, well, how to find international law using techniques is well, how to find good lex rata, and that will decide the value of post manuals. I think. Great, thank you for that. Thank you for that detour that we took. I now want to. Make sure we bring Mark into the discussion. Mark, <laughs> from the commercial's perspective, are you worried from what you've just heard? Um, what are your, your concerns about conflict in space and its effect on your satellites and planet's uh, business model? Yeah, I'm not always the token on a panel, but I feel like as a non-lawyer, <laughs> I'm the token. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, just to give some context, Planet is an Earth imaging company. We have 200 satellites in space. We image the whole world every day. And that data is multi-use. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about conflicts, you know, the assumption that the conflicts would be, be between nation states, but it's unclear. I mean, as Brian said, any conflict in space that produces some, some sort of debris, that debris is non-discriminate, and that debris will be up there for quite some time, and that debris will have quite unintended consequences. Um, but even the non-debris creating events, which we've already seen, um, both on national systems or on commercial systems, have lasting impacts. Mm -hmm. And there's uncertainty around what uh, governments will do about it. So it's great to hear these conversations to get some more certainty. But it's also unclear where the lines are. Uh, it's a little bit of a wild west still. Um, but companies like Planet, we provide our imagery and analytics to nation states, who you could argue then use it sometimes for national security. We also provide it to disaster agencies, to human rights groups, to scientists. Um, and so would, would such a disruptive incident on one of these entities be lawful or not lawful? Uh, we obviously have an opinion on that, but it's still unclear how the world will play out with that and, and where the laws will be on this. So what we're seeking uh, in this conversation is that as a community that we continue to have these conversations and that we 
protect space for being a, a, a place that does not have conflict of this nature because the, the effects are lasting and they, they impact not only the, the security side but also the civil and the human rights side as well. Thank you for that. So now we have the manuals that are out or about to be out. We can find, we can start to look at them, see the content of them, see if we agree with them. Brian, you were involved in both manuals. I want to ask you uh, if you could give them advice on where to go from here in terms of mm -hmm. dissemination and promotion. Um, what type of advice or, or, you know, from a broad perspective, where do we go from here with these manuals? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just reiterate the intent, right? The intent of these manuals is to inform and educate about these issues. And as was mentioned, although I don't think explicitly, there are multiple other manuals in the world. Mm -hmm. There's the San Remo Manual on Maritime Warfare. There's the Harvard Manual on Air Missile Warfare. There's the Tolan Manual on Cyber Warfare. So Woomer and Malambos are envisioned in that same pedigree and in that same standard. And they're things that are there to help inform decision makers, inform commanders about how law impacts the things they're gonna be doing. Uh, so I'm very glad that both manuals exist because I think they're going to help advance the discussion of these issues. And as, as we just pointed out, it's really important. This is a big topic that could have wide ranging impacts on commercial and civil users of outer space, as well as the military and security users and pretty much everybody. Um, I think there's two challenges that the manuals have to deal with. One is they need to talk to two audiences at the same time. They need to have a conversation with you know, really deep, wonky legal conversation with the experts in the field because there's a lot of unanswered questions. Mm. But at the same time, this is something that the public is increasingly interested in and policymakers interested in. And so the, the, you know, the, the, the manuals and the experts behind it also have to find a way to talk to the public and talk to the media and talk to policymakers in a way they can understand. Uh, and, and, and you know, maybe try and keep those two channels from you know, overlapping a little bit just to uh, reduce confusion. So that's a real challenge that they're going to deal with going forward. Um, the second, it was sort of a hint at it earlier, is you know, if you want to ask, hey, is it legal for me to attack one of planet satellites? Mm -hmm. You're not going to find that answer <laughs> explicitly in either of the manuals. Attack right? someone else's man. <laughs> me. Who else would you prefer they attack? No, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you're going to find is, well, here are the certain situations where it might be considered a use of force or, or certain things to keep in mind if you're planning an attack. There, there is not going to be an easy answer because it's a very, as an experience, a very complex issue. So I think that's the other challenge the managers are going to have is, you know, people might come to them looking for that really explicit, easy answer, and it's not going to be there. Because in one case, thankfully, we haven't had mm -hmm. what I would consider an armed attack or even really use of force against a satellite. Mm -hmm. Or at least one I've seen that United States have declared to be. So that's good news, right? But that also means we don't have a lot of practice or precedence that we can use to help create answers. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm, I now I want to ask, and I want to return to you, uh, Professor Aoki. Uh, get, is it a problem that we have two manuals for the same type of conflict or the same scenarios? Because he, Brian mentioned, and we know we have, you know, the Tallinn manual on cyber and, and, you know, the San Remo for maritime. But when we look to the space domain, actors, stakeholders may look, well, what's the manual for conflict in space and see that there are two. Is this a problem that there's, you know, this possible divergence? Oh, thank you for your question. Well, it's not problematic, but first of all, well, both manuals are not, well, don't cover the same area. So Miramos, just from during peacetime rules to the extent where the self-defense is exercised, and only Umera manual takes care of the rules during international armed conflict. So it's not, well, overlapping anyway. But if it were, I don't think uh, it's not problematic at all. On the contrary, it's a good thing because the black letter rules, well, Miramos has 52 and uh, Umela has 48. They are kind of, well, both have, have some overlapping places like uh, self-defense or use of force or retortion or countermeasures. That black letter rules are not so different, almost similar because they are the 
almost a reiteration of the, well, Lex Rata, I mean, uh, the Outer Space Treaty or UN Charter or other major treaties and the general international law. But if some difference, some small difference of the rules is found, that's the difference with the interpretation, how international law is going into some direction where, where, where it is, and commentaries. Commentaries must be rather different. And then, its interpretation cannot be one. It's not, well, the law doesn't exist that way. So which interpretation, well, is on what evidence and on what direction, or, well, it's that, that was the starting point to talk well, between the well, experts with two manuals and uh, well, other, uh, other relevant, well, relevant or uh, interested people to think about the lex, real lex rata and uh, on, on, above that, how, in which direction we should go into. It's not the well, law as it is, what kind of law we should have. So to formulate that, yeah, it's uh, having a, a variety of rules and interpretation. It served to provide it to well, readers, to the community. It's a good thing, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to now go to the next set of professors, uh, <laughs> Melissa Desart and Andrea. Uh, you know, the Tallinn Manual, had two editions, Tillin 1, Tillin 2.0, and it was the, that second edition was really seen as an advancement. Yep. And w you know, a real successful that they went from you know, this first version, now Tillin 2.0, seen as more widely successful, but I see that they're even uh, making efforts to make Tillin 3.0. Yeah. Do we need to do this for these manuals, or what do you, Chris, they more just broadly? Came out. Come on, man. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know how much work went into these? <laughs> Uh, look, I'd have a few things to, to say to that. One, I one is I think, um, you know, we we do hear that space is a wild west. I hear that, you know, a lot, and I think, well, it can't be that much of a wild west if it has two manuals already, right? So th there's clearly a lot of law. Um, I think that, you know, the other, th yeah, I think they will need to be updated because, you know, even in the time that the manuals have been worked on there have been examples of state practice and this is this is what's been said multiple times is that you know a group of academics can sit in a room and get really excited about article 9 of the outer space treaty and i don't think we've talked nearly enough about due regard over the last you know two days so i think we need to really up our game on that <laughs> so we can sit there and we can get terribly excited um, about what are the possibilities within the outer space treaty to solve the problems that are existing now and that we can see uh, evolving um, but that's not what the manuals do, because they can only describe what the law is now. So we can't, in the manuals, really give a full um, articulation of perhaps the different purposes that many of us hope that, you know, principles of due regard will be able to solve, you know, in cis lunar space or on the lunar surface. So will we need updated versions? We absolutely will. And you know, you can only um, do so much state engagement, which is part of the process of manuals, is to get feedback from states. But again, what we will really see, and this is where Tarlin has done multiple versions, is it's responding to how states are using and picking up principles or perhaps changing some of the, the principles that were articulated in Tarlin. So I don't know if any of us have the energy to go through another... Uh, uh, project of doing a manual, but if we did, I think, yes, we will need updated versions, um, and it probably will happen quicker than perhaps it's happened in some of the other domains, like Law of the Sea, for example, but those manuals are also being updated. Um, but I think it is important to to just reiterate that, that these are not just like legal academics or lawyers um, hypothesizing about what the law may be. They're having to be very, as you talked about, what the sources are that they could use. They had to be existing elements of law. So there's a lot more, a lot more work that we will need to do as future uses of space occur. Thank you. Andrea, did you, did you have a reaction? 
Yes. So first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Deswart, for bringing up due regard. I need to have a button made that says, ask me about due regard, <laughs> uh, because I think it's incredibly important. And I'm going to be that person for a minute and plug my recent article from earlier this year that was published in the Chicago Loyola Journal of International Law. It's open source and free, so you don't have to have a login. You can find it online talking about the principle of due regard, which I believe is a tool that states already have in their toolbox. It's binding. It exists in the Outer Space Treaty but states are just not using that tool. It's sitting unused and they can pick it up and they can use it. And I think personally, in my you know, professional opinion, it is the most valuable tool that we can use going forward from a state practice perspective under the Outer Space Treaty to deal with these novel uh, and evolving emerging technologies and interests in outer space. Back to the main point of the, of the question here <laughs> in terms of updating the manuals. So for Talon, Talon focuses on cyber activities, which are evolving very, very rapidly. Cyber activities are very expensive, excuse me, inexpensive to get into at a ground level. So states and militaries can really rapidly increase their cyber capabilities. And so the state practice in cyber is evolving very, very fast. Things are changing all the time. Stuff is happening all the time. So I personally think that the pace of updating would be inherently faster for Talon, for cyber, than it would be for space, because the state practice is a little bit slower to evolve in space, though it is going more rapidly now than it has in the past, simply because there is a cost entry barrier to space uh, activities, right? When you're launching things into space and having to deal with complex orbital mechanics, which is not a problem with respect to cyber. Eventually, the manuals will need to be updated. Personally, I hope that's not because we see an uptick in conflict in outer space because that would be the fastest way to need an update to the manuals would be if we start to see use of force in outer space, which I don't think any of us want. Uh, but certainly, state practice, even without use of force, will eventually need an update to the manuals, as was described by my colleagues. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Mark. We've just heard how academia uh, are sitting back and trying to define what the Lex Lata is and being you know, uh, very ambitious and trying to restate what the law is. But w from your perspective, what do you think the commercial sector and commercial actors can do f if they would like to prevent uh, you know, the specter of conflict in space? You know, it touches a little bit on the round table we had yesterday, uh, talking about how, how commercial sector and companies and, and, and governments can be good actors now and not wait for necessarily the rules, the laws, the norms, the international agreements that will take a while to come uh, and how we don't have the time to wait for that. And so we have to, we have to move forward as we are now. And, we have to, and the way we move forward is by uh, uh, aggressively being good actors and aggressively um, being stewards of limited space. So my, my background, my PhD is in astrophysics, so I can tell you space is large, but, as, but uh, usable space is not. I mean, it's, I know Brian was, was making a point that compared to the ocean, it's quite large, usable space, but it's actually quite small and it's, uh, it's not really interchangeable. So when we, when, we, when we mess it up, we mess it up. So protecting it now and being a good steward. Hopefully we can find an ability to be proactive here. We are, we are seeing that there, the divide in space, which since we started going in the 60s, was basically nation states, is now, as this conference is showing, is, is leaving quickly. Commercial, commercial capabilities in space are growing rapidly, that we're in the space renaissance. And so if we're talking about conflicts in space, the dominant player in space is gonna be commercial already and, and it very soon. And so legitimate targets and such get very complicated already. I mean, multi-use targets. I mean, the question is almost absurd to us. Um, so I'm very happy that these exist, but I hope, as you pointed out, we never get there uh, because these aren't really, we're approaching the world where these aren't state actors. These are commercial entities. And the same information that we're using for security on Earth are also being used to predict where the next drought is or find wildfires or monitor coral reefs um, and, and, or cell phone calls, et cetera. So, so I, I fear that the legitimacy of these targets is, is dramatically going away and, and soon none of these targets hopefully will be ever considered legitimate. 
All right, thank you for that. Looking to wrap up in the next few minutes, I have a very interesting question that we got from the Q&A. Uh, it's a very pointed question, though, and so I'm going to try and restate it and see if there's anyone who, who uh, offers a response. Is it plausible to define what a weapon is <laughs> in space for legal purposes? But listen, that would, that would be able to allow for distinctions excluding dual-use technologies like cooperative, RPO, lasers for scientific purposes, et cetera. Like, it, wouldn't it be a good idea if we could definitely whitelist some activities? Anyone? So, uh, so, so as the, the, the technic, one of the technical advisors to both manuals gets this question a lot. Mm. Uh, the, this is, it's not unique to space, right? There's many other domains where we struggle with defining what a weapon is. And you just look at, like, look at counterterrorism and, and you know, how people can turn things that are rather innocuous, cars or whatever, into weapons if they so desired. I'll say the, the, the reason this question is challenging is what is driving the change in the dialogue from defining weapons as things to defining activities in space mm -hmm. that may or may, that may are, are, are of aggressive nature or weapons-like nature or irresponsible nature, right? That is, the, that is the change in dialogue that has happened in the last few years in the multilateral discussions going from the, the previous era of how do we define and ban weapons things to how do we define and limit and prescribe behaviors in space. Because it is slightly easier to identify behaviors, we have space, space situation awareness, other, act, other things we can use. It's not, not totally easy, but it's slightly easier. Mm. And can I just add to that? I absolutely agree. Um, the issue of, of, of weaponization of a position or of information. So sometimes a conflict um, in space can be really just about a use, perhaps of a commercial asset, so what we would call kind of grey zone activities. Mm -hmm. So certainly nothing involved there is a weapon, but the outcome can still be the same. It's still a rival or a situation. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you for that. I know that we're almost ab out of time, so I'm going to ask our audience to thank our panelists. Thank you so much.